In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the drugs used in the management of osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a condition that is characterized by a compromised bone strength that then predisposes a person to an increased risk of fractures. This is seen mostly in old age or postmenopausal women. So in order to understand the drugs, we'll take a quick look at what happens in osteoporosis and how the drugs affect this process. Our two main players are the osteoclasts, which are responsible for bone resorption, meaning breaking down bones and releasing minerals, and osteoblasts that are responsible for bone formation. Physiologically, bone is constantly in a state of remodeling, so it's being broken down and reformed continuously. This happens because it maintains bone strength by replacing old bone with new proteinaceous material that then ossifies over time. And of course, there is an element of iron homeostasis. In osteoporosis, the balance is significantly in the favour of the osteoclasts, so in favour of breakdown of bone, leading to a decreased bone strength. You can have primary osteoporosis, which happens post-menopause, as oestrogen levels decrease and osteoclast activity increases because oestrogen acts to inhibit osteoclasts. Or you can have primary osteoporosis as a result of old age, where you have less vitamin D activity, meaning less calcium being absorbed from the gut, and so the body starts taking calcium from the bones instead. Secondary osteoporosis happens as a result of some other pathology, such as rheumatoid arthritis, endocrine causes like hyperparathyroidism, Cushing's or diabetes, malignancies and glucocorticosteroid use are also other causes. Alright, so let's get on with the actual drugs themselves. A lot of them focus on reducing osteoclast activity, but I'll include some that increase bone formation at the end. First off, we have the bisphosphonates. They're often the first line therapy. Examples include alindronate and zolidronate. The way these work is by attaching to hydroxyapatite, a mineral form of calcium in bone. Then the osteoclasts will bind onto the bisphosphonate and is therefore unable to bind to the bony surface. Bisphosphonates are then able to enter the osteoclast and disrupt the enzymatic processes within the osteoclast, preventing bone resorption. They also play a role in osteoclast apoptosis and in reducing development of precursor osteoclasts. Side effects of bisphosphonates include acid reflux, esophagitis and ulcers. People experiencing these may be given the bisphosphonate IV. Other side effects include jaw osteonecrosis, which is an exam favourite, and hypocalcemia. Next, we have the selective oestrogen receptor modulators, or SERMs, an example of which is raloxifene. We use these because oestrogen is involved in osteoclast inhibition by inhibiting rank L, which is a protein that increases osteoclast activity. But oestrogen also acts by inducing apoptosis in osteoclasts. Oestrogen itself could in theory work, but it comes with an increased risk of breast and endometrial cancer. SERMs are oestrogen receptor agonists in the bone and in the heart, but they are antagonists in the breast and the uterus. Denosumab is our next medication. Parathyroid hormone can stimulate osteoblasts to produce rank L, which increases osteoclast activity, but denosumab is a monoclonal antibody against the rank L. It has been shown to be as effective as the bisphosphonates and it is mostly used in postmenopausal osteoporosis. The last one to mention before we move on to the ways of increasing bone formation is calcitonin. This directly inhibits osteoclasts and is secreted by the parafollicular cells of the thyroid. It hasn't been shown to be as effective as bisphosphonates in osteoporosis but can be used alongside bisphosphonates especially in treating hypercalcemia. The main side effect is hypocalcemia. Okay, so now let's have a look at some options to increase bone formation. We mentioned parathyroid hormone earlier, but as well as leading to rank L production and increased osteoclast activity, it does have some favorable effects in osteoporosis. It stimulates the maturation of osteoblasts, it increases calcium reabsorption at the level of the kidney, and increases the activity of 1-alpha hydroxylase, the enzyme responsible for activating vitamin D. In case you don't remember, vitamin D increases calcium absorption from the GI tract and calcium reabsorption from the kidney, 
as well as increasing osteoclast activity, it also increases osteoblast maturation. It also has a role in the negative feedback leading to decreased parathyroid hormone. Now remember that the overall effect of parathyroid hormone is bone resorption, which of course is not what we want. But feriparatide is a form of recombinant parathyroid hormone that when given in low doses actually has a net effect of bone formation. This is because it mostly stimulates osteoblast maturation without having much of an increase on bone resorption. Finally, we have vitamin D itself, which is very commonly given to help support patients at risk of osteoporosis. Now you may be thinking, why would you give vitamin D if it increases osteoclast activity? Well, similarly to parathyroid hormone, it does have effects on bone resorption and bone formation. But remember that vitamin D also really helps in maintaining appropriate calcium and phosphorus levels in those at risk of osteoporosis. So that is why it plays a big role in osteoporosis management. Finally, remember that activated vitamin D must be given to patients with renal failure because they can't activate it themselves 